Hi guys, my name is Scott Laffer. I'm a member of technical staff at Cumulus Networks. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is web scale uh, ways of deploying OpenStack networks. Uh, so very quickly, we'll talk about you know, who Cumulus Networks are and why we're actually here today, why you as the OpenStack users should care about the networks, uh, talk about some options for tenant networking, um, and then looking at those options and what they mean from a networking perspective when you go out and deploy them. And then if the demo gods are kind, we'll have a quick demo at the end. So Cumulus Networks um, came about when, uh, sorry, uh, to start with a history lesson, uh, servers, uh, the key differentiator in server technology used to be in the hardware. When you had a Sun server, you had to run Solaris. When you had an, an IBM mainframe, you had to run AIX, um, but when the x86 chip came around, that dynamic changed incredibly. You can now have a dedicated software vendor and a dedicated hardware vendor, and you can go out and pick the best of breed from what you needed and what you wanted to spend from a, uh, a money perspective as well. The same was not true of networking until recently. Your Cisco switch, you must run iOS or Linux OS. Your Arista, you must run EOS, your Juniper, Junos. But when companies like Broadcom started coming out with ASICs that everyone started to use, that same paradigm shift happened again. Why would a mega scale company go to a Cisco, a Risa, or a Juniper, pay their price premium, and use the software in the way that they want to when they can go direct to the manufacturer and then have the smarts in house to build their own operating system in the way that they want to use it? So um, our founders helped do this for a, a couple of work scale companies and went, well, hang on a minute, this makes a whole bunch of sense for enterprise as well. Why can't the enterprise people, just like they do with the server market, um, pick their hardware, whether they want to go best to breed with a supply chain or direct to a manufacturer for a lower price point, and then pick their software on top as well. So Cumulus Linux is a Linux distribution that runs on top of networking switches. Uh, we're Debian and Jesse based, and um, the, the user experience is effectively having a Linux server with 3254 ports, um, the, that runs line rate networking performance. So we do everything from one gig with PoE to 100 gig on 32 ports and now uh, chassis as well. Why should you care about the network? And you know, keeping on the theme of you know, interesting analogies to use with OpenStack, uh, my, my girlfriend asked me last week, you know, what are you going to go present about? And I used inspiration around Ramsey's Kitchen Nightmares as one at the time, and I said, well, OpenStack is a bit like Ramsey's Kitchen Nightmares. You know, it started off, it was a great idea to run, an, uh, run a restaurant, but you know, the, the time to get it working, there were issues, there were problems, and uh, you know, someone comes in as the product matures, we end up getting a fantastic product by the end of it after a lot of yelling, screaming, and carrying on. Um, just like we have seen with OpenStack over the last three, four, five years. Now at a state where we're, they're serving great food, OpenStack is fantastic, but at no stage of that, did they think about the poor dishwasher? You know, at the end of the day, if, if you have a restaurant and you're serving food and your dishwasher breaks, you now can't plate up, you can't serve, and so people are going to go elsewhere to fulfill their needs. And the same thing goes with networking. And the question is, at what stage of you building a restaurant do you think about the dishwasher? Do you want to have lots of redundancy in there? Um, and so on and so forth. Or, you know, will you be willing to uh, not be able to serve if your dishwasher breaks or someone doesn't come into work and so on and so forth. Um, just a quick recap on OpenStack networking types. ML2 is the, the standard for neutron networking. It's a, a framework that provides uh, two types of things. It provides mechanisms and types. So to start with the types, these are the network types that you're trying to deploy. You have you know, traditionally a flat type. This might be your provider network, no VLANs, Everything is in the one broadcast domain, all of your subnets. And then we start to look at tenant separation. You have your VLANs. Um, and then more modern times, we go to VXLANs as well. And then there's your mechanism drivers. This is what are we deploying those type of networks on? You know, from a server perspective, we can go out and deploy Linux bridges to do our tenant networking, or we can deploy the OpenV switch, and it has its own bridging inherently. And then when we start to look at it from an external networking perspective, there's switch mechanism drives as well. We can go out and deploy VLANs and VXLANs on other networking devices that are not just your end compute hosts. So with this, this is Linux bridge as the mechanism driver with VLAN as the type driver. And this is what happens when we deploy a VLAN type tenant network. 
we create a bridge for every tenant network that we do. And then in order for us to facilitate communication between them, we need to have a network that understands VLANs in between. So a switch network that understands VLAN using trunking to get more than one VLAN out on every single link. What that means from a networking perspective is we need to use redundant technologies like MLAG between all layers of the network. And MLAG is multi-chassis link aggregation, and it's basically where we uh, trick a device to thinking that it's connected with more than one link to one device. Instead, we're using two. We have a, uh, a split redundancy there. And, and this is a time-tested and well-proven network, and this is a way that a lot of people you know, have deployed networks previously, that every host will have a bond coming out of it with multiple VLANs trunked, um, and the switch will do the same thing. But there, there are problems with this when we start to scale it up. Um, VLAN scale, for instance, the VLAN, uh, there are only 4,096 possible VLANs. It's limiting you to 4,096 possible tenant networks in your environment. And then when you think about that as well, what happens when we deploy a new tenant network? You know, uh, the, the switches inherently create the bridges, but the network needs to be prepared for as well. So we can pre-provision them. We can go out and manually configure all those broadcast domains that we're going to use straight away. We can manually do it when the creation comes in. You open a case with your networking team, say, please trunk this VLAN here and here. Or there are things like the switch mechanism drivers that we talked about earlier um, to go out and do that for you. Um, but these things, again, when we start introducing more and more broadcast domains, there's an overhead on that switch because the switch is involved in that forwarding. Um, for every VLAN that you have, you're going to have a state machine that runs things like spanning tree. Are we blocking, learning, listening forward? For every port and every v, uh, VLAN on that port, we have that state machine. So as you start to scale up, the switch starts working harder. You introduce MLAG, you've got to do max synchronization between the two. And as you start to hit the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 VLANs or even lower, depending on the amount of ports you've got in your VLANs, <coughs> the switch starts to work very hard and starts to get a little bit flaky. The same thing goes with upgrades of your switches. At any possible point, if you lose a switch in your network, you're losing 50% of your bandwidth. If you lose a spine switch in this example, you've lost 50% of your in-between layers of network bandwidth. Um, and there's no way to gracefully do that if you're going to upgrade a switch. It has to go down, and it is typically not a graceful scenario. We can then start to, especially if you're running bare metal workloads, start to look at some technologies in, with layer three to mitigate some of those problems. So in this case here, we've got an IP fabric. So every single one of these is a routed link. And we're able to use equal cost multipath to take away some of that uh, brittleness and use uh, a whole bunch of redundancy that layer three routing uh, enables us to do. So in this case here, we're still doing VLANs up from the host, uh, but then we're mapping them to a VXLAN. Uh, you know, this could be a software-defined controller of some kind that's doing this mapping. It could be BGP, VPN, uh, or you could be doing it manually. Um, and there are also uh, elements in Neutron that can help take away some of this pain for you as well. But while we're introducing some stability and some scalability into this, and removing some of the, you know, the VLAN limitations, we're adding more complexity in here. It becomes a, a much more different thing to manage. Um, and at the same time, the MLAG scale problems are still there. You still have max synchronization that needs to happen, and now you have the potential for more broadcast domains. But if you're looking at bare metal workloads, this is something that you might want to consider moving to. Conceptually, we're at the same thing when we start to look at Linux Bridge with VXLAN. Uh, we're still deploying a bridge for every tenant network that we're doing on the host, but instead of having that enslaving the upstream interface, we're enslaving a VNI or a VXLAN interface. And what this does is it encapsulates any packets that come to it, same uh, switching technology that's used before, but it's encapsulating it in IP. So we have a, um, a single address on the host, and every packet leaves VXLAN encapsulated through the router network till it arrives on the other side. What this means we can move to is a routing and layer three topology that extends all the way down to the host. Um, this scales incredibly well and is useful for more than just OpenStack, but container deployments as well, where we now get that same equal cost multipath available from the host. So we're no longer limited to two-way up. We can go three-way up, four-way up, eight-way up, depending on your redundancy requirements as well. Um, and we're able to take control of this dynamically by putting a routing daemon on the host. And, you know, 
if I say routing in BGP, how many people sort of tense up and feel a little fearful? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And, 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 and there's fair reason for that. I mean, traditionally, BGP and other routing protocols have been hard to configure, hard to maintain. What um, the innovation we're really trying to push here is that we can go to simple networking topologies using the same concept without being, being hard to configure. We can go to almost plug and play L3 networking. We use something like unnumbered, which means we every device has one IP address. It uses link local IPv6 dynamically to bring up a BGP peering. And all we need to do is simply specify an interface. The, you know, every organization has one of these, a big Excel spreadsheet with all their slash 30 point to points and all their subnets and all that kind of thing. If you can do it interface based, that requirement moves away. And this just doesn't extend to the networking topology in your spine leaf. This can extend all the way down to your host as well. So if we compare the pair, um, looking at it, uh, if you looked at bum traffic handling from an L2 perspective with your VLAN type driver, we're still doing flood and learn over the network. There is a whole bunch of uh, redundant traffic that will hit other links where L3, uh, which is VXLAN and the overlay technology, we're going to use L2 pop. There's a, uh, a project within uh, ML2 that takes that L2 information that would normally be flooded across the network and uses the uh, communication technologies in OpenStack to do things like proxy up and up suppression. It dramatically reduces the unnecessary traffic on your network. In terms of network redundancy, you've got MLAG and STP, which is a 50% loss if you ever lose a thing, and you're losing redundant paths in network to STP versus equal cost multipath. You can use all the links at the same time and dynamically load share on them. In terms of the tenant networks that you can use, it's 4096 versus 16.7 million. Uh, if you did want to do a multi site uh, OpenStack deployment, you'd need to, if you're using VLANs, use a network-based L2 extension technology, a VPLS, uh, an OTV, or even VXLAN again. Uh, where if you're doing an L3 multi-site uh, with overlay technologies, you can use, um, all you need is point-to-point, -point, uh, sorry, not point-to-point, -point, uh, IP reachability between your compute nodes. Um, when you bring on a new tenant network, you have to involve your switching if you're using VLANs. You must use a switch mechanism driver, you must manually do it, you must pre-provision. If you're doing overlays with L3, it's not required at all. When you lose a switch with VLANs, it's a 50% loss versus one to the nth if you lose any one of your switches in your routed fabric. And of course, you can't gracefully remove a switch in L2 activity, but you can by appending AS or artificially changing routing metrics to remove a switch for upgrades in your network. You're no longer facing loss and outages when you need to upgrade elements of your network programmatically. So what we're going to do now is uh, we have an OpenStack Metaka uh, running routing on the host, uh, running on this laptop, and it's running full BGP unnumbered everywhere. So each host has one IP address. It dynamically peers with each leaf. Each leaf dynamically peers with each spine one IP address per host, and that's all that requ is required. What we're going to do is artificially, well, we're actually going to introduce a fifth switch. We're going to go three-way ECMP from the host. We're going to add 50% more bandwidth without any impact, and we can take it away as well. Okie dokie. So we've brought up leaf five over here, and this is the spine from up the top. If we do an IP route show, we have here a whole bunch of equal cost routes to our compute nodes that exist. This is leaf five that's come up. It's got no configuration. It's got no routes. If we jump over to server three and server four, those are the ones that are being introduced to that new leaf. Again, we've got two hops up the network at the moment. And if we jump into the routing daemon, we've got two peers that are based on the interface. If we look at the configuration here, we can see here it's simply naming that interface. And if we jump back onto these guys here,
can see here again that it's all simply interface based. Uh, we're going to use Ansible to push this out. So if we look at the differences that we've made here, we've simply just made some changes to a variable file to provision that new switch up. So we're adding the variables for leaf 5 to create the new neighbor entries based on the interface. And then as we move down, there's some on the spines as well to bring that in. And then we're just simply adding it to our host file. If we now do Ansible playbook, networking.yaml, it's going to go out and check all networking against that variables file. That variables file that's maintained in, in Git uh, with change control is the defining state of our network. By running this playbook, we're enforcing that state. Um, so we're going to go through. We can see the changes applying to leaf 5 and to the spines. And by the end of this in a second, Sorry, running out of RAM. <laughs> Okie dokie. We now have equal hops three way down to those compute nodes three and four. And from the compute nodes perspective, sorry. we now have three hops up as well. The same thing applies if you want to add a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh leaf, more spines, more servers. It's simply a case of adding one IP address and the interfaces into a variables file and then being able to use VXLAN type tenant networks on the host to dynamically scale this out. We have customers that have been doing this for more than four years. Um, and I guess the emphasis that we really want to push is this is not hard to configure. There should be no fear in going to L3 from the host. You know, why not start with that rather than starting with those L2 environments just because it appears to be simpler now? Any questions? Should? So why, why BGP? Uh, it, the, the question was why BGP um, internally? Uh, there are applications for it in the data center. You have very granular control of which prefixes are shared where um, and a whole bunch of programmatic rules as to, um, you know, as an example here, we're, we're filtering uh, the, the host from not learning the spines and all that kind of stuff. And that can be done with uh, OSPF as well, but the benefits you get from being able to match on an AS basically is, is one of the, the key advantages to doing that. The, this... Um, Routing daemon is, is the one that we use on our production switches as well as the one that's being used in the host here. Is really optimized for the data center. I mean, typically people think BGP, oh, it's gonna take 180 seconds for a, a neighborship to come up and then a route to be advertised. Um, BGP, and there's a whole bunch of you know, great articles on this, but BGP being used in the data center with great timing and great route filtering is a, uh, a lovely programmatic way of being able to control a routing fabric. The same thing can be done with OSPF, and yeah, heaven forbid you could do RIP as well. <laughs> but you know, BGP is the one that, that we see success with, and um, most web scale people use in some element of their network, even internally. Uh, so, uh, the full meshing is typically used with IBGP because there are certain rules around internal BGP. Uh, in this case, um, there are a lot of private ASNs, both in the 2-byte and the 4-byte ranges, that enable you to use eBGP internally. Uh, I think there's uh, 65,000 reserved 4-byte uh, ASNs that we use. So, every single one of these devices has its own ASN, uh, which enables us to identify it through the network. And it just requires point-to-point -point connectivity. No, L Linux Bridge has had uh, VXLAN capability for quite a while. So we're actually using Linux Bridge, which is our abstraction mo uh, model from what we push into hardware, um, as well as VXLAN in Linux Bridge on the host as well. I think it, uh, it got it early in the, the four train of kernel.
It's a good question. Uh, you know, it, it is a cumulative total minus the switch that you're, that you're taking out when we consider that, that bandwidth allocation. One more, one more question. Do you design the best cumulative total or something else? Uh, it's probably a good question to take offline because there are a whole bunch of factors to do with the application as to how you design an oversubscription ratio and, and things like that. Um, so if we can take that offline, that would be great. No, there, there is a, a standard for it, RFC 5549, uh, and other vendors are slowly starting to pick it up as well. I mean, you know, it's something that, that Cumulus prides itself on of you know, inventing and then opening up for, for the rest of the world. But it is now a, a, an open standard done under different names, but if you, if you ask for RFC 5549 compliance, they'll uh, should be able to help you out. Awesome, cool, thank you very much.